So, um, novelty and uh, functionality. Uh, I participated um, in a small way in the uh, legal review of the uh, uh, design protection regime, which uh, took place a couple of years ago. And in that, we identified some areas of design law which we felt could benefit from clarification. And um, at the drop of a hat, both uh, of these two major issues we identified seem to make their way very easily towards the Court of Justice. Um, functionality, uh, there was a referral from the OLG Dusseldorf in the Dusseldorf and Ceramtec case, and on novelty, uh, appeals from EU IPO up through the General Court, um, joined cross appeals, one by the holder of the design and one by EU IPO on different points of law. So, beginning with functionality, um, the Dossaram decision itself is towards the uh, terse end of the spectrum of Court of Justice decisions. We all know how these things are. Sometimes they're a little bit like the oracle at Delphi. You have to guess what the oracle is saying to you and afterwards with the benefit of hindsight you see how wise it was but it isn't always clear with the benefit of foresight. So because the judgment itself is uh, at terse I want to start with the travaux preparatoire and uh, the beginning of the process was the Commission's green paper back in 1991 and they said several things about their intention at that time in relation to functional designs. So um, dotted throughout, I haven't put the references in, but um, the purpose, they say, is to protect designs which are defined as the two-dimensional or three-dimensional features of appearance of a product which are capable of being perceived by the human senses. No further aesthetical criteria are applied but the appearance may not be dictated solely by a technical function. Now, it's worth holding that formulation in your mind very clearly because that made its way more or less verbatim into the final uh, texts of both the regulation and directive. Um, may not be dictated solely by technical function, no aesthetical criteria. They explained at some length what they meant by this. They say at one point, design industry itself usually considers that design is the result of three elements, a functional improvement or technical innovation, a creative contribution of aesthetic nature, and an investment by the manufacturer to develop the two preceding elements. The Commission accepts that designs which meet all of these criteria are undoubtedly deserving of protection. A strict application would, however, lead to a limitation in the number of designs which could be protected. When speaking of design, the Commission wants also to cover designs which might lack one or other of these elements. So there you have, as well as the all three combination, you have investment plus functional improvement, uh, functional improvement plus creative contribution, creative contribution plus investment. A little uh, further down, they explain that um, exclusion of features dictated by technical function is well known in the laws of the member states, as of course it is, um, and uh, they explain the meaning of that. They say if a technical effect can be achieved only by a given form, the design cannot be protected. On the other hand, if the designer has a choice among various forms in order to arrive at the technical effect, the feature in question can be protected. Understood in this way, the exclusion from protection corresponds exactly to the idea expression dichotomy of copyright law. And what they mean there, it's the particular species of the idea expression dichotomy that we call the merger doctrine, where an idea is, so, as it were, so specific that it can only be expressed in one way. Um, they conclude what is meant in reality is if there is no choice when designing a product with a given effect, there is no personal creativity displayed and consequently nothing to protect, at least under copyright or design law. Um, later on, they are discussing the desirability of introducing a test of 
whether the buying public uses aesthetic considerations when buying products. And this was a test we had in our UK law at that time in 1991. And they rejected that. They said there appears no valid reason why the design of, for example, surgical instruments should not enjoy protection just because their appearance as such is rarely considered by the surgeon. So that was the Commission Green Paper, uh, a fairly upfront and clear statement that uh, functional, innovative function as well as uh, aesthetic considerations both lead to a protectable design. This survived into the explanatory memoranda for the 1993 draft legislation. Um, pretty clearly, the, no distinction, says the memorandum, is made in the regulation between aesthetic and functional designs. They are equally able to attract protection. In extremely rare cases, the form follows the function without any possibility of variation. In such cases, the designer cannot claim that the result is due to personal creativity. So again, the, the equation of dictated by technical function with only one way of making the design and therefore no design freedom to the designer. Um, the provision provides for unprotectability only to the extent that there is no freedom as regards arbitrary elements of the design. And later on, again, they repeat, no aesthetic criteria are applied, aesthetic and functional designs are equally protectable, however, um, features necessary to achieve a technical function and which leave no freedom as regards arbitrary elements are unprotectable in order not to monopolize technical functions by way of design protection. A little bit later, it's irrelevant whether the design is of an aesthetic character or functional or and whether it is decisive for the end user's choice of product. Um, and then they explain that some people are concerned by granting protection to functional designs they say that experience shows this distinction is largely arbitrary and protection for functional designs needs in any case to be provided for by some means. So we've got to 1993 and there's still, I would say, as clear as the nose on your face indication that the Commission wanted protection for functional designs, provided they could be made in more than one shape. Reaching the 1996 draft, the wording was changed to its current form. So, design rights shall not subsist in features of appearance of a product which are solely dictated by its technical function. And a, re a recital is added that says, technological innovation should not be hampered by granting design protection to features dictated solely by a technical function. Whereas it is understood that this does not mean that a design must have an aesthetic quality. And there, just to remind you, is pretty much exactly what the Green Paper said it was talking about. Um, the Commission's reasons for making this change were, they said, um, even though Parliament didn't adopt an amendment, the Commission felt that clearer wording was needed. But they continued to refer to uh, protection not being available in those extremely rare cases where form necessarily follows function, which is what the previous draft had said, extremely rare cases form necessarily follows function. Um, we came to the first uh, instance where the Court of Justice considered the issue at all, uh, and it cons uh, the Advocate General in the Phillips case, um, in his opinion, made some clearly over to dicta remarks about the difference between the test for functionality in trademark law and in design law. Um, he explains that the wording is different and it's not accidental um, and he explains that the exclusion should be broader for trademarks than it is for designs and in the end he says in the context of designs the feature concern must not only be necessary but essential in order to achieve a practical result form follows function this means that a functional design may nonetheless be eligible for protection if it can be shown that the same technical function could be achieved by another different form. So hopefully uh, you've seen that the Advocate General in Phillips was fairly faithfully replaying the remarks in the draft, uh, in the, the introductory memoranda and in the green paper itself. So far all consistent. After the Phillips case, the UK court reversed its 
uh, previous case law and followed the opinion of the Advocate General. Uh, the German courts largely did so too, is my understanding, as did the courts of several other countries. We then uh, come to the sort of uh, knee point in the, uh, the, 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 the arc of functionality, which was a case called Chaff Cutters or Linder and Franzen's, uh, an EU IPO Board of Appeal case. And um, here David Keeling, I think it was, gave an exposition of um, the board's view of the functionality exclusion. He says, uh, in some cases, functionality will be the dominant preoccupation of the designer. The need to make a product that works will be uppermost in the designer's mind and will largely determine the appearance of the product. As long as functionality is not the only relevant factor, the design is in principle eligible for protection. It is only when aesthetic considerations are completely irrelevant that the features of the design are solely dictated by the need to achieve a technical solution. This is not, it must be stressed, tantamount to introducing a requirement of aesthetic merit into the legislation. Now, let me draw your attention to two slights of hand in this. Firstly, the transformation from what the, the statute says, which is uh, a des it does not imply that a design must have an aesthetic quality. There's a difference between an aesthetic quality and aesthetic merits. The one is um, something that exists or does not exist, and the, the other is a threshold of variable height. So I don't think that there's any indication at all that the recital was saying um, you only can't apply aesthetic merit tests. Uh, I don't think it says that at all. Um, and the second little bit of sleight of hand is um, features of a design solely dictated by the need to achieve a technical solution, not what the statute says. The statute says solely dictated by the product's technical function. No ambiguity about this, what the statute says. Um, nonetheless, uh, the Board of Appeal moved away from the multiplicity of forms test in that case. Um, and it, it, it needs to be said, this, the Lindner case was a case of something that pretty much all of us would agree was a functional design. So the issue isn't really with the Board's conclusion, but with the means by which it reached those conclusions. So why reject the functionality of the multiplicity of forms test, which was fairly clearly what the Commission and indeed the Advocate General in Phillips had envisaged? Two justifications uh, are given by the Board. Firstly, if it is accepted that the multiplicity of forms test applies, Article 8.1 will own, apply only in highly exceptional circumstances which is akin to saying, well, if, if, we, if we read it that way, it'll be toothless, it'll be narrow. But actually, highly exceptional circumstances is precisely what was envisaged if we go back to 91, 93, 96, extremely rare cases, is precisely what was foreseen for this. So I find personally that justification a little bit unpersuasive. Um, the answer to the perceived problem it lies in something outside of EU IPO's remit, which is what an infringement court would do with such a design. And the answer is the infringement court would read such a design very narrowly or omit some features entirely from their analysis as being functional. I don't think it's necessary to um, strike down a, a borderline case. Uh, so that justification, perhaps unpersuasive. The second justification is, is uh, more on point. Um, if a technical solution, uh, says the board, can be achieved by two alternative methods, neither solution is, according to the multiplicity of forms theory, solely dictated by the function of the product in question. This would mean that both could be registered and the same person would then monopolize the function concerned. And uh, this uh, theory has certainly been floating around for a long time in the UK. It uh, was first cited, I think, in a 1927 uh, UK case. So it's a, a reasonable, I would say, logical attack on the multiplicity of forms theory. It suggests at least that in the way the Advocate General stated it in Phillips, it might be a bit too broad. Um, and that leads us to 
the Dossaram and Saramtech rather neatly, this Dossaram and Saramtech case, um, because Dossaram, the holder of the rights, applied for uh, not one but 17 designs in the same application, but each of them is independent of the other now, uh, on rather similar um, uh, products, as you can see, rather similar designs, I should say. The top bank of seven differ in their, their proportions a little bit, but otherwise are identical. The next bank down has a little sort of shaft halfway up the neck, which you can see most clearly on the right, but otherwise are just diff different proportions, variations. And the bottom rank have a, a snub nose rather than a, a, a conical nose. But again, uh, other than that, they're all pretty much the same. And these things are used in a factory for holding a piece of metal to be welded in a particular configuration. And the, um, as the name suggests, both Dossaram, the holder, and Ceramtec, the alleged infringer, make these things out of ceramics. So um, litigation took place in uh, Dusseldorf, and the, um, the court in Dusseldorf, as I understand it, had generally been applying the multiplicity of forms test up until that point, but was here presented with very clear evidence that there were a multiplicity of possible forms, namely these 17. If none other, there were at least 17 different forms, all of which had been uh, registered by the proprietor. So the suggestion must have been fairly strong in the mind of the court that um, the proprietor here was trying to do precisely what the Board of Appeal had warned against in the Linda and Franzen's case, namely monopolize every possible solution to a technical problem in a set of different designs. Whether it was successful in doing that or not is an entirely different question. That would depend on the scope which the infringement court gave to these things, of course. But uh, for sure, if they didn't create an absolute monopoly, they created a minefield, which it's a difficult, little bit difficult to walk through as a competitor. So um, the, that, I think, raised questions in the mind of the court about the multiplicity of forms theory. Um, and as I understand it, uh, the court heard evidence from the Ceramtech designer, which is a somewhat unusual thing as far as I know, um, to the effect that the designer conceded, in fact, that there was only functional considerations had been on his mind when he made these designs. So the case was sitting itself up nicely um, to follow the uh, Board of Appeal uh, in Lindner and Franzen. Now, uh, funnily enough, in Lindner and Franzen, um, there was also evidence from the designer, and the designer in Lindner and Franzen swore that his particular chaff cutting roller had been designed with aesthetic considerations in mind. And the board didn't believe that, uh, and frankly, I don't believe that either. Uh, but it does illustrate the difficulty of relying on the subjective evidence of designers, uh, which is that they are liable to say what's in their interest. Um, so, the OLG Dusseldorf referred to the uh, Court of Justice two questions, really, and the first one um, was rather carefully worded, actually, but was essentially asking whether multiplicity of forms was the only applicable test if um, a designer had, in fact, not really thought about anything other than technical considerations. And the second one asked whether... Uh, a subsidiary conclusion in Linden and Franzen's was correct. The subsidiary conclusion in Linden, Linden and Franzen arose from the board's desire not to be bound to follow the designer's declaration of what his intentions were. Um, really, the, the board in Linden and Franzen was inclined to say the test is what was the designer's intention. Was it purely functional or not? But since they had a sworn statement from the designer saying that their, his intention was not purely functional, some means had to be found, found to get, deal with this. And the means found was to say that the court or the tribunal does not have to take the subjective evidence of the uh, designer. Uh, the board said it goes without saying that this must be an objective test. And they postulated a new person, an independent observer, who would be the person who would ask himself or herself, do I think that anything other than function could have been intended? And of course, um, the board itself would constitute 
an independent observer, the result of the uh, independent observer test is therefore that it's ultimately a matter of opinion for the tribunal whether a design is functional or not. And the only evidence required is the opinion of the tribunal, which is a, a hard bit of evidence to counter as an applicant. So that was the second question asked, and um, the tone in which it was asked suggested that the court didn't think it had to postulate an independent observer, and the Court of Justice uh, agreed with that. So what did the AG say first in Dossaram? Firstly, the AG uh, looks, I think, quite correctly at, uh, at the preparatory materials in saying the key question is where the formal constraints connected with the product's technical function stop and where its designer's freedom of choice starts. And that's an absolutely accurate summary of, of what the green paper says about uh, design. Um, he then concedes that the explanatory memoranda concede that Although, if you look, there's, an, an, again, a little bit of sleight of hand going on there. He says, both designs that tend toward a certain aesthetic and designs that fill a certain practical use are equally protectable. Well, that's not quite what the explanatory memoranda said. If we remind ourselves what they said, they said very clearly um, that aesthetic and functional designs are both equally protectable. No glosses on that, like... Um, intended to fulfill a practical use, which is a different test. So, some glossing going on, um, but the conclusion at the AG is that the, the, the issue is that the designer has no freedom in the design of the product. Um, so, um, some, some correct analysis in the AG's opinion, but a, another tr a transformation here from whether there is or is not freedom, which is what the Green Paper, the 93 Memorandum, the 96 Memorandum said, to whether a creative role is played by the designer. The Memoranda say, if there's more than one way of doing something, then there's scope for a creative role, and that's the end of the test. The Advocate General seems at this point to be implying from that a positive requirement for a creative role from the designer. We then come to the, the Court of Justice decision, and the reasoning of the AG is almost entirely ignored in the Court of Justice decision. Uh, so it's not clear that the Court agree with it. In fact, I think it's rather clear that they don't, um, except at one point. The, um, some positive points in this judgment first, because it is a, a, um, a bit of a, a curate's egg of a judgment, some good points and some bad points. The, the, the first point, which is a good point, is the clear acknowledgement that it's not essential for the appearance of the product in question to have an aesthetic aspect to be protected under that regulation. And the court have got it right when the Board of Appeal got it wrong. No discussion of aesthetic merit. The question is an aesthetic aspect. Aesthetics are just not in it. However, appearance is in it. The appearance of a design is the decisive factor, which is something the Court of Justice has been saying for some time quite correctly. Um, then, however, their conclusion is that um, the answer to this question is the functionality exclusion applies where considerations other than the need for that product to fulfill its technical function have not played any role in the choice of those features. So the court has moved from what was uh, clearly the intention, I would say, of the legislator, which was to apply the multiplicity of forms test, no more, no less, to uh, moving to the question of whether um, function was the sole driver, the sole intention, the sole motivation for a design. Um, it's important to step back a bit at this point, and to me, there is a significant difference between these tests. You may be asking yourself, does it actually make any difference? Um, and probably in many cases it doesn't. But really in the design process, you've got three people to think about. You've got the designer, and sometimes designers put creative effort and energy into a product. 
that the public really doesn't care about or appreciate. I mean, there are people at Apple who obsess about which particular shade of white the Apple logo should be in, in the same way that if you go and try and buy white paint in a shop that sells decorating materials, you'll find 20 different colours of white, you know? Uh, designers really care about the stuff, even if the public doesn't, because that's their job. Conversely, the public has a view different to designers about things. Uh, if you're trying to sell product to men, you sell it on the basis that it's functional. You don't sell it on the basis that it's aesthetic. You sell men Dr. Martin uh, boots because they're tested against acid corrosion in a factory and they look kind of chunky, you know? And jeans are workman's clothing. That's why we wear jeans, because we want... And lumberjack shirts and all of these things. That's how you sell product to men. Men buy product on the basis that it's, aesthetic, it, it, it's uh, functional. That is our aesthetic. Functionality is our aesthetic. So the public's reason for buying something is actually sometimes aesthetic, even when the product has been designed for functional reasons. Um, I have a, friends who drive around in ex-army Jeeps, Land Rovers and things like that, because they like the sort of quasi-military look of these things. So the public's aesthetic is different sometimes to the designer's aesthetic. And then finally, if you're a competitor in the marketplace, you don't care too much about aesthetics. What you want to do is sell product. And therefore, you want to know, are there alternative shapes available to me to sell this product? That's the question you're asking yourself. You, you're not asking yourself, what did the designer think when they were designing this product? You, all you're saying is, I want an alternative. So they're, uh, looking, at, looking at whether there are alternatives is a very practical thing for competitors in the marketplace, in the same way that looking at designers' intention is natural if you're focusing on the personality of the designer. Or, to a court that's familiar with trademarks, looking at the consumer reaction is a very familiar and typical thing to do, even if it bears little relation to what the designer wanted to do. So these tests are not the same, absolutely not the same. Uh, you, the public might be buying something because it likes the look of it, even if, in fact, it is the only conceivable shape to make a product in that will fill a certain function. So... Um, Enough about that. We got a clear steer from the Court of Justice um, that this is the issue. Considerations, what considerations went into the design is the issue. But not a positive requirement that those considerations should include aesthetics, merely that those considerations should include something other than function. Um, as to the point at which they approved the AG, they say... As the AG stated in points 66 and 67, such an assessment must be made in particular having regard to the design and issue, the objective circumstances indicative of the reasons which dictated the choice of features um, or information on its use or the existence of alternative designs, provided that these are supported by reliable evidence. Well. The first thing I would applaud here is the word objective. Objective circumstances is absolutely the test because, for me, a publicly registered right cannot be dependent on the secret mental state of the designer, known only if he's cross-examined, assuming he, he or she hasn't died in the meantime. It's, it's absolutely unacceptable to base a public right where competitors should be able to know what their position is on the subjective hidden mental state of the designer. So, objective, I applaud that. Um, we will look at what the AG said in Paris 66 and 67 in a minute. But then the other issue here is the word or here. So, what does this mean? In particular, having regard to the design, the objective circumstances indicative of the reasons or information on its use or the existence of alternative designs. So, the question here is, having said that the, the question, the, the, the legal issue is all about the designer's intention, is the court saying that the means of proof could be any one of these exclusively? In other words, that you could in fact simply only use the existence of alternative designs which fulfill the same technical function. That is, uh, in fact, no more or less than the multiplicity of forms test, which they reject elsewhere in the judgment as, as being not decisive. So these ors give us some, some question. I think the best view is that they're saying that the courts have to take an overall subjective assessment. 
What did the AG say in 66 and 67? Well, he says um, uh, the design concerned, all the circumstances surrounding the choice of features, bearing in mind the evidence provided, and any measures of inquiry ordered by the court. What he means by measures of inquiry, I think, appears two paragraphs later when he talks about courts commonly ordering an expert report when faced with complex questions of this kind. So um, a, a clear invitation to all tribunals judging this, including EUIPO, to use expert evidence, independent expert evidence. Um, in 67, he says it's not impossible that criteria such as the multiplicity of forms and the subjective intention of the designer um, may none, nevertheless be included in the body of specific evidence. Now, here I have a question because when the Court of Justice says objective circumstances indicative of the reasons concerned, but refer to paragraph 67, do they mean that the designer's subjective statement is an objective circumstance. For me, it isn't and it will never be, but there might be things like parallel filed patents, for example, which the court has taken account of in the uh, Lego case and other cases. So those kind of extrinsic um, statements of a designer's intention might be evidence there, but uh, do, the, do the Court of Justice really intend us to allow back in the subjective intention of the designer? I'm a bit doubtful whether that can be considered to be objective evidence. So it seems likely to me that the, the court is requiring national courts and tribunals to undertake um, multifactorial assessment. Um, what, 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 what do we conclude? Aesthetics is out, thank God for that. We are not requiring designs to be pretty, just to have a striking appearance. Appearance is in a dis but anything that meets the individual character test would have to have a different appearance anyway. So what does the stress on appearance lead us to? Does it, does it mean that a design has to be created for its appearance? In other words, something about the, the designer's perspective? Or does it mean that it has to be purchased for its appearance, which is something about the consumer's perspective? Um, objectivity is in, and um, these judgments should be made on evidence. And the independent observer test is out. And to me, those two things go together. Judgments ought to be made on the evidence, not on the opinion of the tribunal sitting as an independent observer. Um, as I say, we're unclear about the subjective intention of the designer, and we're unclear about the role played by multiplicity of forms here. Uh, for me, I would say multiplicity of forms can still be a decisive test, but only in ruling out designs. If a design can only be made in one form, Clearly, it monopolizes the function concerned and therefore must be found to be invalid. So for me, multiplicity of forms still works as a rule-out test, even if it's not decisive as a rule-in test. Um, and then finally, what is the status of this design freedom issue, the, the, the issue of you know, design starts where design freedom begins, which was fairly crucial in the AG's opinion and uh, has featured in several EUIPO Board of Appeal decisions. It, is it now subsumed into the multiplicity of forms subtest? I think that's probably the answer to what's happened to that. Uh, and finally, what about this kind of secondary material about designers' intentions? So things like advertisements and patents, which the court has sanctioned uh, taking account of in the, uh, in the Lego case following somewhat what the US courts did in the traffics case. Um, is, do these things have a role? Or if you have an independent expert, is there really any place for this kind of secondary evidence? So all of these are questions that the court has left open to us, really. What has the court done here? It's, it's thrown away a couple of former uh, case law approaches, followed by the national courts before harmonization, and done its best to substitute a clean sheet with an autonomous test for functionality. Um, good points about it, as I say, it's clearly not the same test as for trademarks, which is something uh, that was intended from the beginning. It's clearly objective, not subjective, and uh, that's necessary, I would say. And it clearly doesn't drag us back into the realm of aesthetics, which is something that for designers died with the 19th century. 
possibly less good are that it has thrown the ball up in the air and left it for the national courts to catch as to what, in fact, you decide. Um, the Dossaram case itself went back, of course, to the OLG Dusseldorf, and I have only read the judgment in uh, a very bad Google Translate, so I apologize to all German judges and lawyers here, especially those in the OLG Dusseldorf. But my impression was that the court actually then went on to decide the case on a basis that I find inconsistent with the Court of Justice. Again, based on poor translation, so I hope I'm wrong. Um, they refused further cross-examination of the designer, and that's fair enough because the designer had already been examined at first instance. They attributed the advertising by the holder of the design to the designer. That, so the, the claimant said, well, you know, the designer says he did it for aesthetic reasons. Uh, actually, no, did not say he did it for aesthetic reasons. But um, the, sorry, the designer... Uh, the statements by the holder in the advertising did not come directly from the pen of the designer. But nonetheless, the court attributed them to what the motivation of the designer might have been. There was also a lot of argument about whether in the court of justice proceedings, the holder had conceded that uh, the public bought these things only for technical reasons. Um, and the court uh, proceeded on the basis that that concession had been made. And so the designs were found invalid. But the little bit of reasoning, if I've got this right, is that the, the courts looked at the type of product concerned. And these, these products, these welding pins, were what I would call capital goods. In other words, they go in a factory and they're used to make other things. They're machines for use in machines for making other stuff, not consumer products. And um, the, um, the court seems to me to have said that when these products are purchased by professionals and used, um, these features are used only for their function and that it's the fact that they fit and the longevity of the products that are the key aspects of these products. Elegance, even if that is achieved by these products, is not an aspect that gives you any economic advantage and industrial customers only buy product for their economic advantage. So there's a, a, a bit of a chain of reasoning here along the lines of the buyer, we think, only buys for economic reasons. Therefore, the seller can't be caring about anything except functional reasons. Therefore, the designer can't be uh, thinking about anything other than functional reasons. That seems to be, if I'm right, the chain of reasoning there. Um, just to highlight that this is a, a significant difference from the former practice, at least, of EUIPO and, and the intention uh, of the legislator. So the green paper deals somewhat with this. Um, they say um, design isn't only a tool for marketing. Um, they talk about design in our homes, offices, shops, and factories, including tools, is deeply influenced by industrial design. Protecting design is tantamount to encouraging development of a trend which has brought to people living in industrial countries an enormous improvement, not only in the material aspects of the quality of life, but in their receptiveness as regards beauty and comfort. To summarize, they're repeating the arguments made really ever since William Morris and the arts and crafts movement, and certainly espoused by the Bauhaus school, that design is about the workplace, that uh, you cannot simply say it's for use in a factory, therefore forget about anything other than function. Um, one of the objectives behind protecting design was that design has a role in enhancing the workplace. Um, in the Lindner and Franzen's case, the chaff cutters case, the board was careful to say, in the case of most products, designer will be concerned with both functional and aesthetic elements. That applies also to large items of industrial equipment. Um, and they go on to talk about enhancing the working environment of the people who operate it and see it in use. And I think they had perfectly understood there what the, what the legislator intended uh, design protection to, to include, namely not only marketing, not only sales, but the, the aspects, social aspects of design. Um, uh, uh, so they say, no objection in granting principle to industrial products 
whose overall appearance is determined largely but not exclusively by functional considerations. A couple of later cases, the one on the combine harvester here, you might have thought was really the kind of product you would buy only for function, but the Board of Appeal was happy that um, the entirely technical aim wasn't proven and um, there was no contradiction between technical usefulness and aesthetic appearance of a product. That's virtually the mantra of designers since the Bauhaus. And in the pallets case down below here, uh, likewise, uh, the board said the technical function of a pallet does not mean that all of its features are to be regarded as solely dictated by its technical function. So, um, again, whilst it, the, the uh, Dossaram case may well be another case where the, the OLG Dusseldorf has come to the right conclusion, perhaps, but if their reasoning was that in capital goods, industrial products, the buyer doesn't care about appearance, and therefore the seller doesn't, and therefore the designer doesn't, that cannot be acceptable to me because um, one of the, the points of, of good design is to try to enhance industrial uh, environments as well as all others. So um, I would be personally very wary about regarding the Court of Justice decision as a license to vastly increase the scope and bite of the functionality exclusion. I, think, I see the Court of Justice decision as much more nuanced than that, as, uh, and I don't think there's any justification for excluding industrial products and limiting design protection to the consumer sector. So, um, no single test or set of factors has been proposed, and indeed the Advocate General said it wouldn't even be useful to have even a non-exhaustive list of such factors. So every court and every tribunal will need to review its approach after Dossaram. Probably we have a multifactorial approach, and for industry that is less clear than a bright line approach. Um, if pro properly applied, multifactorial judgments tend to be expensive because you have to provide evidence on a number of sources. Um, and if not properly applied, multifactorial assessments can lead to arbitrary. Uh, judgments. So um, have the, has the legislator's original intention to protect functional designs, uh, except in very rare cases, fallen by the wayside? I think it's too early to say for sure, but um, there are already many voices who have seen the Court of Justice decision as a broadening of the functionality exclusion, and I think uh, we shall be careful that not to jump to that conclusion. Let's move now to the world of shower drains. So um, Easy Sanitary Solutions was a case concerning the product at the top there, which is, uh, a, it goes in your shower, the, the curved bit is sitting underneath, and so the water runs out and down through a pipe. And you can't see that bit in use. Oh, thank you. And um, as... Uh, community design law excludes protection for features which are not visible in normal use. Those parts are really not part of the design. So what we're dealing with really is what you can see in the right-hand view there, um, which is a central sort of plank, as it were, and two gullies on either side of the plank which the water goes into. Um, the uh, invalidity division found that this design was invalid based on a catalogue and the catalogue picture is shown below and it shows an elongate um, plank as it were corresponding to the middle part of the protected design but not showing the gullies or side channels on either side of it. Uh, the Board of Appeal disagreed with the invalidity division um, correctly identifying the fact that these side channels were not disclosed in the picture concerned. The um, applicant in response to that, as I understand it, looked to other parts of the catalog which showed how products of this general kind were applied in situ. And this wasn't, I think, a shower drain cover. This was 
perhaps intended for use in somewhere where you drove vehicles in and out. Um, so there was not necessarily a drain on the underside, but it doesn't matter about the underside because it wasn't visible in normal use. So where we got to then was that uh, before the Board of Appeal, the applicant, was, uh, the applicant for invalidation took the, the picture used at first instance and some other diagrams showing how you would deploy that product and attempted to combine them to make a disclosure which would invalidate. Um, the holder argued that a shower drain is a different product to this industrial type of water drainage system. And so there was a question about, is it in a different product in a different sector? And the uh, Court of Justice held that it was, uh, that, that the indication of product or the product in fact were irrelevant if the design was the same, then that's the end of the story. Um, and that is uh, something uh, which was consistent with the practice of EU IPO up until that point. The um, second point addressed in the judgment was one on which EU IPO appealed, which was when you're attacking a design for individual character, do you have to show that the prior design was in fact known to the informed user? The court said, no, you don't. And again, I think that was right, and that was EU IPO's practice to date, so that was fine. Um, the third interesting point, I think, was that um, in relation to this putting together of bits of prior art, so the court said, it's for the party who lodged the application to provide the EU IPO with the necessary information, and in particular to identify and reproduce precisely and entirely the design that is allegedly earlier. And th those words look an awful lot like the Siekman criteria, which seem to get everywhere these days. Even smells seem to involve Siekman these days. Um, so that seems like a, a, a relatively higher burden of proof on the applicant. Um, and let me just um, compare that with a couple of earlier general court cases. So this a T6810 watch on a lanyard case, the lower uh, picture is the prior art and the upper picture is the registered design. And the, um, the, the general court said it, it's true that the representation provided merely shows two strips going in different directions but no loop supposed to be worn around the neck. But they relied on the fact that associated invoices used the word lanyard and so they implied into existence the rest of the loop. And they go on to say, um, in relation in particular to a design that's being used directly in trade without being registered, it may be the case that there is no graphic representation of the design showing its relevant details. In those circumstances, it would be unreasonable to require the applicant for invalidity to provide such a representation in all cases. Well, it seems to me that the Court of Justice has now said, yes, you do have to do exactly that. Um, if you look also, and I don't have time to, what the Advocate General said, the Advocate General seems to say pretty much that. And likewise, Shenzhen Taiden, the communications equipment case, um, two bits of prior art, prior disclosures were combined, the upper ones a prior design registration, the lower ones a picture from a catalogue, and um, the design registration didn't show the, the view with the screen up, so the uh, applicant for invalidity used the lower one as well and said basically they're the same product and the general court said the applicant merely challenges that these are identical in general terms without presenting either arguments relating to characteristics differentiating them or other facts which suggest that these are not actually two representations of one or the two designs. Uh, one, one and the same design, I should say. In other words, in this case, the, the general court put the duty onto the, uh, uh, in the holder of the design to uh, show that uh, the two earlier designs were not the same thing, rather than putting the obligation onto the attacker to show that these two items could be combined and were the same thing. So I, th I think um, you see in the easy sanitary case uh, a tightening of what the Court of Justice is asking for, not hypothetical combinations of two things, but some pretty clear motivation to combine. 
Um, impacts of this case then, no real impact on the practice of EU IPO other than perhaps a slight tightening of evidence, but they were going that way anyway. But perhaps some difference to the practice of the Netherlands and perhaps this is a point we could discuss. Um, and um, that is uh, welcome news for applicants who do things like merchandising where they apply the same design to many different products to be told that the, the indication of product doesn't limit your scope of protection is good news. Not so good for the kind of companies who make one thing in the shape of another, as in the Netherlands uh, Kinder, Kinder Capstool case, which was a chair in the shape of a car. So, you know, um, but whether, whether, you know, using the same design and different product really is anything other than repurposing, I'm, I'm a little doubtful. So, um, a, a welcome decision. Um, and um, where it leaves us is with good guidance on how to approach novelty, but still some doubt as to how to approach lack of individual character where the prior design is from a different sector to the design ensued. In other words, if you've got enough differences, material differences between the two that you now look at individual character, the um, regulation and directive are clear that nature of the product and its sector do matter when you're dealing with individual character and we still don't I think have any very clear guidance on how to approach that difference from the court but as for novelty I think we can regard the matter as case closed okay um, that in view of time is where I shall stop so thank you for your attention totally excellent <laughs>